Sunday night I shared uh, some verses from Colossians, and I actually made mention that uh, I wanted to share more of that on a Wednesday, and then the more that I sort of prepared for it, I said, you know what, I'm going to preach this on a Sunday morning, because uh, this is a message that I think encourages our hearts and uh, gives us a whole lot uh, to consider, to think about, to leave with, and so uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. I referenced this verse last Sunday. I outlined some of it Sunday night, but tonight, this morning, I want to actually share a message. Tonight, I'll be moving into chapter 2 of Colossians as we preach through Paul's prison letters. Prison letters. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And then Paul went on, and this is what I shared uh, more so on Sunday night, is because of this, he said, I strive. I, my desire is as God enables me, as God gives me opportunity, as God gives me power, I want to work in that. Paul wasn't striving in his own energy. He wasn't trying uh, to do for the sake of doing. Uh, he was doing for the sake of glory to God. And so with that, uh, Paul gives us really the foundation of what he considered his ministry. And to me, the truth of that is, this becomes the foundation for ministry of any Christian endeavor, be it a church, be it uh, any kind of a ministry, even within our church, Sunday school, uh, uh, from the nursery all the way to senior adult, our men's ministry, women's ministry, the youth ministry, children. I mean, everything, everything that we have uh, should undergird these thoughts. This should be our focus, and that is to preach Christ to warn everyone and to teach about Christ. So preach, warn, and teach. Uh, I kind of called it this morning a vision for West Union Baptist Church. And, and when I was a youth minister, uh, uh, we used to do a thing on Wednesday nights called Life. And, it, and, and then the little byline or tagline to that was a ministry with 2020 vision. And uh, uh, there was a reason for that. But, but, but to, today I want us to consider uh, a vision for our church, a vision for our ministries with a 20-20-20 focus, and that is just a focus and an and alertness and at least a, a, a desire to serve in three distinct areas. And all of us can do it, folks. Every one of us can be a part of this ministry. So, so Paul begins, Paul begins by saying, in him we preach. Him being Jesus. Now, I guess uh, this is kind of what I touched on last week, but I got to kind of bring this up. Uh, Paul talks about the mystery, the mystery. Chapter two, he's going to talk about the mystery again. He's going to keep talking about this mystery. The mystery doesn't mean that, that people can't understand it because there were false teachers that were influencing the church at Colossae. And what they were doing is they said, we have special knowledge. We have special knowledge and insight that you can't have. And so the knowledge and insight that we have, you have to come listen to us to get that. And I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I'm telling you, that was the crux of it. And that, that attitude is alive and well today. But look, Paul said that what we have, the mystery, the mystery was this. From the Old Testament days all the way through the coming of Christ, God knew what his plan was. Jesus knew what his plan was. The Holy Spirit knew what the plan was, but we didn't. And that is God's kingdom come. And, and that it is coming, that it is, it is something that is happening even now. But the mystery Paul tells us right here, it's not hidden. It's not something that's unknown. It is Christ in us. That was God's desire, that we might come as sinners, confess Christ in, uh, uh, faith in Christ, believe upon him, repenting of our sin, and putting our faith and our trust in Christ alone. But, but the mystery of the gospel is at that point when we're born again, this newness of life that God imparts in us is a new heart. The spirit comes to live within. 
He enables us. He empowers us. Christ lives in us. All of this was the mystery of the gospel. <clears throat> and this is what Paul is talking about in Colossians when he mentions this. He's not hiding it. It's not hidden. We profess Christ. And if you think about it for just a minute, and y'all excuse me, <clears throat> Regan, I'm, I'm sympathizing with you. Paul's faithfulness to preach Christ, to warn and to teach. I want you to see this. Christianity from, from the beginning at Pentecost, well, actually it's the beginning of Christ's coming, but after his resurrection and, and the moment of Pentecost as the church was birthed and the ministry of the church began. I want you just to see this for a minute. The unrefutable proof of the veracity of what these words are are seen in our lives today. Christianity has spread across the globe. The faithfulness of Christ, the ministry of the gospel, has imparted change in lives every, every area of this earth. It is amazing what Christianity has done. It's amazing how Christianity has spread. And it cannot be explained in any other way other than divine. And it should always bring glory to God. And it must bring glory to God. Sometimes we take that for granted. Can you imagine living back in the Old Testament days? God revealed himself to a, a peculiar people, a specific people, uh, the Israelites, and they in turn were to, to describe him to the world. But here we were all the way up into the point of, of Christ coming and living and dying and being buried and resurrected. And up into that point, the influence of Israel was very limited. But after that, Christianity began to spread through the known world. And it has continued to, and it will continue to also. But that is, to bring glory to God, it's the hope that we have that Christ lives in us. And that is the mystery among the Gentiles, okay? Now, with that being said, Paul comes back and said, okay, understanding that Christ in us is the hope of glory, Him we preach. That's what he does. Him we preach. And we have examples of this through the book of Acts. And if you'll listen quickly, I want to read a few accounts of the book of Acts where you can see their attitude and, and sort of their vision for what they were standing for and whom they were standing for. And I want you just to hear this. In Acts chapter 2, after Pentecost, uh, when, when, um, when the uh, uh, Holy Spirit had come, this is the sermon that was preached. Uh, this, and I'm, I'm doing excerpts of it just for time. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Peter says, God proved that Jesus was his son and you know good and well he did. Verse 23, him being delivered by determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. So, so God gave you the Messiah. He proved who he was. And you, God's own people, rejected him. Okay, so the focus is Jesus. In verse 36, he comes back and he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God would call. The focus of the preaching, the focus of the proclaiming, even in the very beginning after the Holy Spirit empowered them to speak, it was about Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. That's what it was about. In Acts chapter 4, listen to this. It came to pass on the next day, the rulers and elders and, and the scribes and Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and as many were the family of the high priest, they were gathered together at Jerusalem. And they said in their midst, this is the man who had been healed. And they asked him, by what power or by what name have you done this? 
Now Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well. In other words, if we're here today because this crippled man is able to leap and walk and praise God, if, if that's why we're here today, I want you to listen and listen carefully. This is what he's saying. Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man stands here today. And it doesn't sound like they were wishy-washy about who they were proclaiming, does it? These were the men that condemned Jesus. These were the men that, that they were scared to death of after Christ died. It was the ones that Peter was, was hiding in a crowd when he was challenged, and he said, I don't even know who Jesus is. Boy, things have changed, haven't they? He is proclaiming Jesus Christ. And he goes one step further, by the way. This is the stone which was rejected by you, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. They preached Jesus. This is what they did. This is what they did. This is what Paul's saying in Colossians. And of course, this is what we're to be about too. In Acts chapter 8, uh, uh, the moment where the Ethiopian unit becomes a Christian, he's riding in a chariot. Uh, God directs Philip to draw alongside of him, to get up in the chariot, to minister to him. God's orchestrating the moment. All this is at work, but I want to I come, uh, in, just for time's sake, to kind of come to where he was. So, so Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He's reading from the prophet of Isaiah. And, and Philip draws alongside the chariot. And he says, do you understand? Uh, and this is what the eunuch, very wealthy man, this is what he said. How can I unless someone guides me? He asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? So, so God has orchestrated a Jesus crossing, a moment where Philip, in obedience to the Lord, runs up alongside. Uh, the man is already reading the Old Testament. Uh, he wants to understand what he's reading. He asks Philip to come up and help him. The scripture that he points at is pointing exactly to Jesus Christ as a sacrificial lamb, as prophesied. And by, by the way, this is the Old Testament. The Old Testament is as valid as the New Testament, folks. Every single page contains references to Christ. If you will look for them, you will see it again and again and again and again. So what does he do? Listen to this. So Philip opened his mouth. He began at the very scripture that this man was at, and look what it says. He preached Jesus to him. Sounds like he was preaching the right thing, wasn't he? He was proclaiming Christ. He was presenting Christ. He was telling him how to know about Christ. Now this led me, uh, and this is sort of what I dwelt on this week. If we're going to proclaim Jesus and we're going to talk about Christ, obviously we think of the pulpit ministry, but I'm talking about all of us ministry. What does it mean to preach Christ? And let me tell you, let me, let me, let me give you two thoughts on this. We can preach about Jesus. We can proclaim about him. And I want you to hear me out on this. We can preach and teach about his doctrine. We can present the gospels. We can discuss his birth. We can talk about his life. We can go in great detail about his death because all of these are described in the gospels in the New Testament. We can consider the resurrection. We can even talk about his return. And most people who are any, any inquiries, any inquirers at all would be interested in these topics. But let, listen, we can amass a ton of information. We can feed our intellect. We can grow in wisdom. We could become scholars of Christ. We could, we could argue. I mean, well, folks, we could debate. We could debate anybody if we get enough knowledge about who Jesus was. We can defend what we believe and why we believe. And I think we should be able to. 
The Bible tells us that we should be able to make a defense of what we believe. We should be able to do that. We should be able to describe in great detail the life of Christ to others. But listen, I want you to understand this. There is a vast difference between preaching about Jesus and preaching Jesus. It's not wrong of anything I just said. We should be able to do all these things. But I'm afraid that we have become a group of individuals in our churches today. We gather and we want, and I'm afraid, and I lament on this. We're not interested in growing or maturing or becoming more deep in our walk or discipleship. We want to feel good about something. We want to be encouraged. We want somebody to pat us on the back. We want to come in with a heartache and leave with a song. Unfortunately, that leads to being entertained, and it leads to, to uh, looking for something. We can't be satisfied with opening a hymnal and singing these great old hymns of our faith that lift our hearts to the glory of God and the death of Christ and the love of Christ and the love of God and the hope of eternity. And we're missing out on so much because we're, we've become uh, uh, attuned to learning and, and adding to our vocabulary with the expense of a relationship. So we can preach about Jesus but we also can preach Jesus. And let me tell you what that means, what it means to preach Jesus, because I think there's a huge difference. When we tell others about Jesus, we need to expound and express to them that there is no other place that you can go to to satisfy your soul. The longing that you have that every single human being has in a relationship to God is met in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you can talk about Jesus, and you certainly can talk about the things I mentioned earlier, but we need to pe people to know that he is the one that is needed above everything else. There is no other name by which man may be saved. There is no other. There's no other way. It is through Christ and Christ alone. We can, we can present Jesus by the, let me use some of the terms he used, as the bread of life. Do you hunger for something that you don't even know what it is? A lost woman that came to church one time years ago came to me and she said, I am searching for something, I need something, and I know it's here, but I don't know what it is. I knew what it was. She needed to be saved. That's what it was. She had a hunger in her soul that only Christ could satisfy. And let me just tell you something. She got saved. It was about two months later. But when she got saved, she hit the ground running. And I tell you, I've never seen such a champion of faith as this woman was. But she knew in her heart that she was searching. Now, let me just tell you, that hunger and that searching, she didn't develop that. That was God looking for her. God began to work in her heart way before she knew who Jesus was. But that's the same for all of us, by the way. Uh, I got word yesterday that one of my dear, 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 dear friends passed away. Uh, uh, the man who, who shared Christ with me, uh, they were best buddies. Now, the man who shared Christ is still living, but his friend uh, died. And I'm telling you, as a, as a young boy uh, from a broken home, uh, growing up in a church, uh, there were men in that church that were such examples to me. They drew alongside of us. They sacrificed and gave of their time. They showed us what it was to be a Christian and to live for Christ. And, uh, and it was this man uh, who drove the bus. <laughs> uh, by the way, at that time, it was Unity Baptist Church. We had a bus that, that was the longest bus I can ever remember. And this man was a race car driver. He took one of his skid car, the dirt track cars, he took his race motor and put in that bus with straight pipes about 25 feet long. It was the only bus that you could hear coming from about two miles away. And there were many times that we had to push the bus. We had to push it off to get it going. It wouldn't crank. We had to push. So you'd have a bunch of teenagers pushing a bus down the road. Uh, and, then, and, and the guy's name was Lloyd Light. Everybody knew him as Termite. Uh, just one of, one of the most precious people. Uh, but when he would pull in to anywhere we were going, 
he would put that clutch in and he'd go down on that accelerator. Wow! And he just loved it. He loved everything about it. But look, in his service and his commitment to Christ and his love, he took me uh, to a camp. And it was at that camp that I understood for the first time that there was a part of me that longed for a relationship with God. And there was an evangelist who preached a message. He didn't preach about Jesus. He was preaching Jesus. And I'm telling you, it made so much sense to me all of a sudden. And I realized the, the seed had been planted. God was at work. But it was at that trip that I came to realize that I needed Jesus. I needed him. I needed Christ. And that's when I asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins and to save me. And I attribute this man that's with the Lord now uh, for being so faithful to do that, okay? Only Christ can satisfy the hunger of your soul. But let me tell you what else. Only Christ can satisfy the desire to have spiritual thirst quenched. If you're thirsty for God, if, if, if you've ever been so thirsty before that you would do anything to, I mean, you drink dirty water. You know, when you, I mean, you got to be thirsty to drink dirty water, but have you ever been that thirsty? We're kind of blessed here. We, we have water everywhere. Jesus Christ is that water that can just quench the thirst of your soul. That's preaching Jesus. It's preaching him as the bread of life. It's preaching him as the, the spring. It's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You eat of me and you'll never hunger again. He speaks in the, in the, in the New Testament and even in Revelation uh, that he's living water, living water. And he is, okay? This is what it means to preach Jesus. As we do that, we also are able to share how we became Christians. And it's important that people understand that our soul longed for the relationship with Christ. Folks, it's not about, look, it's not knowing things about Jesus. It's knowing Jesus. It's not doing things in the name of Jesus. It's following Jesus. Do you see the difference? It is a profound difference. There's a head knowledge of Christ. And you can say, I believe Jesus was the Son of God. And I believe he died for me. And that's, that's a good place to start. But salvation is surrendering to that and letting him be Lord and Savior. It is leading us to repentance of a change of direction and trust. And I fear that so many in our churches today have a head knowledge of Christ, but they don't have a relationship with him, which means they're hell bound and they don't know it. So I think it's very important that we do that. We also as preaching Jesus. We can lift his name. We can exalt his name. We can worship his name. We can call upon his name. We can praise his name. These are all uh, uh, attributes of a person who knows him. It thrills our hearts to consider Jesus. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He really is everything to me. That is that relationship that we long to have. Not a religion, but relationship, okay? So I think it's important that we understand that. Paul also says we, we, it's the mystery of the gospel. We proclaim, we preach, we present Jesus, but we also warn. We warn. That's a part of the ministry. And I think it's a part of the ministry that we're forgetting about. We warn others. We warn without apology. Not, not that we're trying to be cruel. Not that we're trying to condemn but because we genuinely love and are concerned about other people, we warn them. We warn them. Let me ask you something. What do you think is going to happen in the day of judgment? I'm just asking. This is, this is a hypothetical, but it's as real as me standing here. What is going to happen to the person that we were a part of their life and we had some influence in their life and we may have had opportunity to share Christ with them we certainly had an opportunity to live Christ in front of them. We certainly could live an example of what it was to be a believer. But what happens when we choose not to warn them, not to, to share with them the dangers of what could be ahead etern for eternity by neglect and hardening of heart and rejection of Christ? Can you imagine on the day of judgment, people that we loved and cared about standing 
before the Almighty, knowing in their heart of hearts that they're going to be condemned for all of eternity? Do you not think for one minute in that day they wished that you would have said, you are on a path to destruction. Wake up. I bet they did. I bet they did. And I bet they wished you would have. I preached revival at a church, and I said, you know, we, we say we love people, but we push them on down a road of destruction by not saying a word about where they're headed. Something to think about. It really is. So warning somebody, I believe, is very, very important. What do we warn them about? Well, I think the, the, big, the big picture, <laughs> the big picture is we warn them of sin and the awful effect of sin, that it brings death, it brings separation, it brings destruction, and that is the eventual culminating end of sin. And that's what it does. Every single sin, think about this. This is what I shared. I think I might have shared this Wednesday night. Every sin that a human being commits results in a death sentence. If it, if it weren't for grace and it weren't for the mercy of God, none of us would have a chance because we are sinners and we know it. Folks, I'm going to tell you, I've talked to people about salvation and about the Lord, and I've never had to convince somebody yet, maybe one person, but, but never with any effort. Most people recognize that they're sinners. Now, they may not be willing to do anything about it, and they may harden themselves, their hearts toward the gospel, and they may reject Christ. But I don't think it's hard for all of us to come to a conclusion that we're sinners. I just don't think it is. I don't think it's very hard to do. But we need to let people know that. We also need to explain. People know this too. They know this already. Life isn't forever here. The Bible says it's like grass that withers. You know, we, we've not had rain for a while. I told Tracy, I said, I hate that my garden is, needs watering because I hate to water it. But I'm kind of glad it hadn't rained because I ain't got to mow so much. You know, the, the water does something, doesn't it? And so I'm kind of glad I hadn't had to mow it. But look, we understand what that is, that things wither. We understand when it says life is but a vapor, it appears for just a little while and then it's gone. We understand that, that, that loved ones that we care about, they've passed. We've been to funerals. We've said goodbye. It is always a moment for us to reflect. I'll be sharing a message with my family on Thursday. I covet your prayers. Uh, my mother's sister passed away, my aunt. We called her sister. Uh, her name was Gwendolyn. Uh, but, but I can remember her as a child growing up and didn't see her a whole lot. She lived in Alabama. Uh, but usually at family gatherings, her and her husband would come. And, and as I share with the family, uh, I want to be able to share the gospel. That's what I want to do. I don't want to, to waste an opportunity. And it's, as I shared the other day, uh, right out here in this cemetery, uh, I shared with the family. Uh, Ecclesiastes reminds us it's better to go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting, which translated loosely is it's better to go to a funeral than a party because that's the end of all men. We're all going to die. And folks, we need to express to people that there is an end to this. There's a moment. Now, you may not believe what's next, but I think all of us know there's an end. We can warn people there's an end. There's death, okay? So I think that's something that we should be willing to to warn about is the brevity of life. Then as we warn about that, we certainly should be able to tell people the certainty of death. The certainty of death. Uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, 27 says, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. It's appointed. <laughs> the only way, the only exception that I know of to missing death will be Jesus Christ returning and us being raptured. Now that's going to happen to some group of people. It may be this group here. It may be my grandchildren. I'm not sure whose it's going to be. But I know in that moment, the dead are going to rise first and they which are alive, alive and remain, will be caught up in the air. They're going to be changed and will be with the Lord forever. I know that's going to happen, which means there's going to be some folks living that are just going to go to be with the Lord. I, I personally like that way. That would be pretty neat. I wouldn't mind if it was right now. I'm ready. But I, I don't know if everyone's ready. And I want in my heart for everyone to be ready, okay? So it's appointed unto man to die, but after that, the judgment. The judgment. 
We need to warn people that we must all appear before the Lord in the day of judgment. Christian will appear. Our works will be tested. Our sins are forgiven. Thank God we won't be judged for our sin because we'd lose. But the works that we performed in the name of Christ, they're going to be judged. But if you're lost, you're going to stand before the Lord condemned. And folks, you're, you may, listen, you may, and I, I'm not thinking anybody's doing this, but you may cross your arms with a smug look on your face and say, it doesn't bother me. And it may not bother you. On that day, it will bother you. On that day, the Bible says that, that, that everything is trying to hide from the voice of him and, and the wrath of God as it unfolds. It is going to be a terrible time. When God begins to pour his wrath out on this earth prior to the great judgment, kings and great men, people who were proud and arrogant, they're going to crawl up under the mountains and they're going to pray to the mountains. Wrong prayer, but they're going to pray to the mountains. Hide us from him who sits upon the throne. They recognize that day of the Lord is coming. If they would have just cried out to Jesus, they could have been saved. But they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. So folks, listen, I want to warn people about a day of judgment. And with that, I want us to be warning people about the wrath of God towards sinful man. The love of God that has been expressed through Christ is unbelievable. It's unimaginable how much God loves us. But the Bible is explicitly clear that the day is coming when God is going to judge sinful man. He's going to do it. Let me read a couple of verses Isaiah chapter 26, 21. Behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it. And there'll be no more cover to its slain. In other words, all the things that are hidden are going to be revealed. And when God judges, it's not going to be, well, there may not be enough evidence. It will be absolutely righteous and holy and forthright. And the people who are judged and condemned, they're going to know that they are rightfully condemned. As a matter of fact, before it's over, they're going to bend on their knee and they're going to declare that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But it'll be everlasting too late for them. Romans chapter 2 verse 5, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Payday, someday. It's going to happen, folks. It's going to happen. We need to warn people that everyone spends an eternity somewhere. I wish I could tell you that you could live like hell, blaspheme the name of God, curse everything about Him, and in the end, you're going to die, you're going to face a, a, a torment, and then it's over. It's called annihilationism. I wish I could convince you of that. But I can't because I'd be lying because it's not going to happen. The soul, the spirit and the soul of man will live for eternity. One, with the Lord in heaven or two, in a place called hell. There is no other place. I've been reading a really good book. I've, shared, I've mentioned a couple of times. I've enjoyed it so much and I'm actually going back and reading a few chapters. Uh, but it's a quest of, a, of, of an intellectual, of, a, of wanting to find Christ and to answer some questions he had. He became saved in the process. And uh, uh, in it, he makes a tremendous defense of Christianity. But he, he confesses in the very beginning. He said, I still struggle. I still struggle with the wrath of God. And I still struggle with an eternal damnation. And I'll be honest with you. I understand it. I don't necessarily struggle with it. But it's bad. It's really bad. And, and I wish that I could make everyone give their heart to Christ to avoid such a condemnation. The Bible says, it's not, listen, it's not a matter of, of it's coming. The Bible says that we're condemned already. We're living in condemnation. We're living on shaky ground. We're living on a slippery slope at any moment. At any moment we could fall and fail. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, that great Puritan, Message: The people became so convinced at any moment that they could step into eternity that they were holding on to the, to the benches and the pillars of the church for fear that God would let go of that string and they would fall into the flames of hell. It was such a vivid sermon. Folks, listen. We need to explain the eternal nature 
of the spirit of men, that some will live unto eternal life and others unto death. There's nothing that I can do to take any less of the horror of what hell will be like. Well, you preachers, all you want to do is scare the hell out of people. <laughs> you want people so afraid of hell that they'll do anything. Let me tell you something. I don't have the vocabulary or the ability to even scratch the surface of what hell will be like. If we could open up this floor and peer into it for one minute, this place would be empty immediately. And we'd be out there warning people, you never want to go to this place. How do I know that, by the way? There was a rich man who died. Jesus said he lifted his, head, his eyes up in the torments of hell. He had neglected God. He, he neglected everything. He never gave God any glory for his life. He had a poor beggar sitting at his gate uh, begging for food. The, the, the dogs licked the man's sores. And he died and went to heaven. But this rich man died. Now look, he died an unbeliever, but in hell he lifted his, his, his eyes up. He, he wanted just some cool water to cool his tongue, but, but it's not going to happen. It's a place of torments. But while he was there, I want you to hear this. He cried out to God and he said, would you send somebody to warn my brothers so they won't come to a place like this? I don't want anybody I love to come to where I am now. There's not a person in hell that wouldn't be an evangelist if they had another chance to come back and to tell somebody. We've got to warn people. We've got to warn people. And then finally, we've got to teach people. Now let me tell you, preaching and teaching are two different things. One's proclaiming, one's instructing. The teaching, I believe, is about the good news of Christ. I think we teach that salvation is available to all. I think it's important that we present it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But yet in that same moment, Jesus looked and said, but men love darkness rather than light. They wouldn't come to the light lest their works might be reproved. They, they chose to stay in the darkness. Even after God gave such beautiful light, they made a choice not to come to him. We need to teach these things. We need to teach that after we're saved, we become disciples. We become disciples. The Lordship of Christ will bring us to serve Him and to love Him and to honor Him. To, to, folks, <laughs> you don't have to beg a person who is, who is hungering after the Lordship. Of, you don't have to beg a person who is hungering to be a disciple of Christ to make an occasional appearance in the church. You don't have to beg people to do that. You don't have to beg people to read their Bibles or to pray. It's in there. It's a hunger like a baby hungers milk. It's there. It's there. We need to teach that. We need to be able to present the gospel. We need to be able to tell others that God's love has been demonstrated. And we need to teach that. We need to teach that Jesus is coming again. That he's going to return. He's going to rapture the church, that there's reward for the believer. There's wrath for the unbeliever. We need to teach those things. I think the ultimate goal for any church, we need a spiritual nursery with newborns of every age, people who give their heart to Christ. It doesn't matter, hey, if you're 80, if you're 15, if you're 12, when you come to Christ on the same ground as a lost sinner, you're saved and you become an infant in Christ. And then it's up to us to, to make disciples and to grow. I pray that we would have that. I pray that we would spend time to see our new converts grow and to find out what it is. To live what I just said. To proclaim, to preach, to teach, to warn. That we might do that. Ultimately, we want to see mature, growing witnessing, evangelizing, discipling believers. There's a song that we sing. I want to read the verses to you, and I'm closing with this. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus let me learn, more of his holy will discern, spirit of God my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line. 
making each faithful saying mine. More about Jesus on his throne. Riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming, Prince of Peace. More, more, more about Jesus. More about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. I truly want and desire for that to be true for all of us in this room. I want us to know more about Jesus. I want us to know more about his love. I want us to know more about his grace, his mercy, his life, his peace, his kingdom, his, his heaven. I want us to know more and more and more about that. But as much as I want you to know more about that, I want you to know him and to love him and to surrender to him and to call upon him and to be saved by him. That's what I want you to leave here with today. I want us to know more, but I want us to start by knowing him. And when we know him, everything else changes. Let's bow together. Father, I pray today, I pray today that through the work of your Holy Spirit, you will grip the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, that you would show us whether we belong to you or not. And that if we recognize that we're lost, that you would reveal yourself as a savior, the savior. I pray for that deep conviction and at the same time, the ability to believe that you grant as a gift, that faith that allows us to trust in Christ. Lord, may all of this be occurring even now. And I pray for the soul that needs to be saved today. I pray for the Christian who's been challenged today to live a life of consecration, to make a stand. As for me and my house, we're just going to serve the Lord. It's our heart's desire. Lord, may we put a, a stick in the ground, uh, just a line in the sand, and may we as a church choose to live for thee in all that we say and do without compromise. Help us to proclaim, to preach, to warn, to teach that we might see many come to Christ and become faithful disciples. I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.